Just a very quick recap, you know, for though we we re- actually have almost twice as many people listening on podcast as we do sitting here, which is amazing. I have no idea how God is doing that. Um, but for those who are listening on podcast and perhaps don't know the story of Easter, just a really really short recap. You know that this last Easter Friday it was the start of the only three days in all eternity when that perfect unity of the Godhead was broken. You know, that unbearable agony that we think of on the cross when Christ was hanging by his hands, you know, and we think that must have been agony, but there was a deeper agony that he was experiencing. You think of somebody that's been married for 40 or 50 or 60 years and then becomes a widower, and what grief is in their heart. Jesus was on that cross with the weight of sin on his shoulders, and he had been in that part of that Trinity, God, Son, Holy Spirit, for eternity. And now that was shattered. For the only time in all eternity, God the Son was separated from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. What grief must have been in his heart then. But the Sunday. If that was, and that was the lowest of all those throughout all eternity. But the Sunday, that was the day when everything was transformed and something even greater was sundered. The power of death was utterly destroyed. Paul reminds us that in the resurrection, death has been swallowed up in victory. And he quotes these mocking words from Hosea. He says, oh death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? It's these mocking words. And if you cannot hear the sarcasm dripping from his pen, you are not listening. You know, two weeks ago, we looked at Palm Sunday and all of the events leading up from Palm Sunday to the Passion of Easter. And today, I want to do a similar thing, looking at the time after Christ's resurrection until he ascended. What do we learn about authority? What do we learn about Christ's mission in all of that? The first thing I want to say is that we learn that Jesus' resurrection, when we see it, it was for everybody. You know, on that first Sunday, you know, Jesus is in the tomb. Well, actually, he's not in the tomb, but everybody thinks he is. Mary, Mary, um, and Salome, you know, depending on what, what gospel you're reading, they go and visit, and they see that this stone's been rolled away, and they see one or two angels or one or two men dressed in white, um, and they've rolled away the stone, and the guards are scared, and the guards have run away. But Jesus isn't there. Oh, sorry. <coughs> but I want to say, you know, who the, how Jesus timed this, how Jesus set this up was beautiful in its inclusivity. You know, throughout the years, the church has struggled, you know, what do we do with women? What do we do with people outside the faith? What do we do with people in the military? What do we do with people from other faiths? And yet you look at this resurrection. Who was the first witnesses to the greatest event in all of history? It was women. Who were the next witnesses, or perhaps even the prior witnesses to this? Roman soldiers. Who would have been scared out of their boots? But now surely, surely that if you were going to fake a resurrection, if you were going to fake a resurrection, or if you were going to, you know, come in and steal the body. In the ancient Near East, very similar to modern Middle East um, religions now, including Islam, women had no authority. Women had no ability to actually preach or testify. Women could not actually put, they were not considered reliable witnesses. Depending on what Um, sect of the religion you were part of, you either couldn't testify or your voice was counted as half as strong as a guy's or your voice was counted as one-seventh of the strength of a man, you were not considered a reliable witness. Now Jesus, the God of the universe, he created the whole universe, he has been orchestrating everything up until this point and he makes women the first witnesses. Lee Strobel's a, ver- a brilliant apologist. You know, he cites this as one of the many examples of Christ's resurrection. In that world, if you were going to fake it, if you were going to steal the body, the last people you would ever think of would have been women. 
You would have gotten religious leaders. You would have gotten Roman citizens. You would have gotten a group of men, respectable men. But two or three women? You wouldn't conceive of it. But God did. Now, in his resurrection and the, gi- the gift of being able to speak to people about the gospel, which is the good news, and this is the ultimate good news, it was first given to the women just as much as men. The other thing we've got to be really careful of is sometimes we can get into our own little cliques. Sometimes we can think, oh, you know, we are Christians and others aren't. You know, we, this, is, this is just for us. This is what God's done for us. But in the resurrection, we also see that, you know, God did this for everybody because you think about who was following Jesus up until this point. Yes, he had some women following him. Yes, when he went outside of Israel and preached, then he was starting to get a name out in the countries around Israel. But predominantly, his following was Jewish men. It would have been so easy for the Christian faith to become a subset of Judaism. It would have been so easy. You think about what might have happened if the disciples had have been the first people to find Jesus. You know what? Jesus came, he selected 12 blokes, 12 Jewish blokes, but he selected 12 blokes, you know, to be his disciples. And then those disciples found him. And then those disciples kept spreading his word. You know, it would have been so easy. Yes, he was the Jewish Messiah, but the Jewish Messiah was never meant just for the Jews. But if Jesus had have chosen the disciples to discover the body, it would have been so easy with the weight of history to say, well, this was just for the Jewish guys. And nothing would have changed. You know, Jesus would have been relegated to just another great prophet inside Judaism. But in first reaching the Roman soldiers and in reaching the women, and then the word got to the Sanhedrin, And then Jesus stayed here for 40 days after that, being seen at Bethany, being seen inside meetings, being seen by so many other people. Jesus went out of his way to make sure it wasn't just, I rose from the tomb and I ascended. He made it very clear that he had bodily resurrected and he wanted everybody to know it. Because this was not just the Jewish Messiah for the Jews. This was the Jewish Messiah, but God wanted to, that to be for everybody. And we see that right from the resurrection, right from day one. But I said at the beginning of this, another thing that we learn is authority. And I'm going to get to this in a little bit of a roundabout way. But the bodily resurrection, it displays for all to see who has the ultimate authority. And it does it in quite an amazing way. Have any of you ever thought about the process or when mockery happens? When would you mock somebody? Think about a schoolyard bully. Think about a boss at work that you might have to report to HR. But think of, I'm sure we've all had an experience somewhere where we have been mocked. And I'm sad to say, I'm sure we've all had an experience in our life where we have been the one doing the mocking. So we know what this is about. But when you mock, what you are really saying is you have no authority here at all. Think about some common ways that we mock people. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, it's a good thing you were here. Oh, man, we would have been in trouble if you weren't here. The way we mock is we strip power away from anything that we are mocking. That is why it is so dangerous. That is why, especially in youth, it can so affect people because they go away believing that they have no authority. Mockery is such a dangerous thing. But when you see God mocking something, or when you see a prophet of God mocking something it pays to take notice because what you are seeing is you are seeing god declaring compared to me you really don't have any authority it is not you know crushing somebody down and saying you're useless you're worthless it is saying i have all the authority and you don't have any and in the resurrection we see god mocking death Just so you know that I'm not sort of making this up, I just want to point to a few incidences in the Old Testament where you actually find God mocking certain things. If you look at the battle on Mount Carmel with the battle of Elijah versus 850 prophets, he is actually taunting them and he is mocking their religion. 
These are 850 prophets, and they think they've got all the power. They think that they've got everybody in the palm of their hands, and they think that nature and all of their gods are going to come to the party. And, you find, and the NIV does a really bad job of translating this. But, the, but it's actually, you know, when Elijah is saying, maybe your God's asleep, maybe he's on your, his throne. That is the figurative throne. Maybe your God can't hear you because he's on the toilet, you 850 prophets. In the Bible, I'm not making this up. It is hilarious. If you actually read through it, he is mocking their religion. Another time when you see God, there's a king called Aglon and he's incredibly large. He's, he's wide enough for somebody to put a sword into him and that sword disappears. And one of the prophets of God does this. You know, this guy, he was the king because he had all the food and all the resources and all of the money and all of the wealth. And he was flaunting this over everybody because he thought he had the authority. And God actually had an, a, a South Poor left-hand assassin, is actually what you find, called Ehud. Uh, they must have had some wonderful fights over who had the weirdest name. But Ehud comes in and he's actually able to kill this king and get away because he was so fat, because he was so large. And there's another instance where God is talking to a carpenter of all people. And he says, wow, you must be brilliant. You've cut this log in half. Half of it you burnt for firewood and the other half you fashioned it into an idol. Wow, that idol must have power. And one final one. If in the early days of the military in Israel, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. And, you know, they thought, hey, we've captured this God. He will work for us. And they took this Ark of the Covenant and they put it in with all of the other idols. And they come in the next morning and all of their idols are bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant. And they go, okay, something strange is going on here. So they pick up all the idols and they go in the next day and all the idols are bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant again. And God is just mocking all of these other idols because they have no authority. He is the one true king. So then we get to the one thing that humans have feared and the one thing that humans have said, well, that's the ultimate authority. You see, up until the resurrection, humans believed that death was the ultimate authority. That's the thing we cannot argue with. That's the one that we're eventually all going to have to submit to. You know, human beings lived as if death was the ultimate authority. But God had something to say about that as well. You come to the resurrection, and that verse I quoted right at the beginning, I'm just going to give the larger version of that. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. When the perishable has been clothed with the, imper with the imperishable, the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of the sin is law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, you can hear the sarcasm dripping from this page. And with good reason. Who here has ever been, you know, stung by a bee? Yeah, most of us. We're, we're, we're familiar with this analogy. Who here doesn't like bees? We'd actually rather run away from them than, you know, be with any bees. Yeah. It's painful. For some people it can be deadly. Let me ask you this. How many stings does a bee have? One. How many times can it sting you before it dies? Once. Only once. This is how Paul is comparing death. What would make a bee lose its sting? It's already stung something. That bee is in its, de its own death throes. And so Paul here is saying, Oh, death, where is your sting? You stung Jesus, it didn't stick. And now guess who's dying? That's the context of this verse. It is mock this thing that humans have cowered from, have fought against, have gone to the ends of the earth to try and get around of death. Paul is saying to be, to be without a sting, swat it away. It's got no authority at all. You see, people at this time. You know, they might have had some ideas about resurrection. They might have had some ideas about the afterlife. But they were never really sure. 
you know, some, and I think it was the Pharisees, it might have been the Sadducees, but some of the Jew Jewish leaders, they thought that resurrection would come at the end of time. You know, once this world is destroyed, then there will be a final resurrection. You know, others thought that resurrection was just allegorical. You know, well, oh yes, I'm renewed in my spirit, or I'm renewed in my hope, and yes, I'm resurrected. But they thought it was allegorical, and there wasn't really a resurrection at all. In the Greco-Roman cultures that we find ourselves in, in back in 2,000 years ago, they had so many gods and so many different beliefs, you were never really sure which one it was. But it was untestable. Nobody had ever died and then risen again not to die again. You know, we find a couple of instances, you know, where Jesus brought somebody back from the dead, but he still had another death awaiting him, but not Jesus. Jesus was the first one to come back to conquer death and not be subject to it again. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Romans, they didn't want to lose this theological grey area. They had a very vested interest in being the ones who controlled what people thought. And anybody who challenged that idea, they needed to be sidelined or they needed to be removed. You know, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling um, council, they knew this also. If you were to look into Acts 5, starting from 35, this is one of their speakers called Gamaliel. He addresses the Sanhedrin. He says, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. There's a couple of disciples that had been caught preaching. Some time ago, Thaddeus, he appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to, his, rallied to him. He was killed, and all of his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean, he appeared in the days of the census, and he led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and his followers were scattered. So in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men and you will only find yourself fighting against God. You see, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the Romans, they were all betting the farm on one claim, that if the leader is dead, the followers will scatter. You know, it's hard. We sometimes don't realise we are 2,000 years removed. You know, because we know how important Christ is, because we know who he was, we don't, we're not aware that in that time there was actually quite a few people who presented themselves claiming to be the Messiah. You know, you would get somebody and he would raise three or 400 people around him, normally his brothers and cousins and uncles, and, you know, he'd raise everybody together and say, I'm the Messiah. And, you know, they would try to take on the Romans or they'd try to kick the Sadducees out from helping the Romans. And you know how you knew who the Messiah was? He was the guy that didn't die. But the response was always the same. The Romans used the cross like the ultimate anti-terror weapon. If you challenged the Romans, if you said, I'm the Messiah, I'm the king, the cross is what awaited you always. In 70 BC, there was a string of wars, there was a whole bunch of slaves, and they were in open revolt against all of their masters. If anybody has ever read the books or read the books or um, watched the movies about Spartacus, you know, this was, that, this was that revolt. And eventually the Romans won, and at the end of the fight, they had captured about 6,000 people who were standing up against the Romans. This had been a direct challenge to Rome. It was saying, you can't treat slaves this way. We know better than you. Rome, this is a challenge to your authority. Those 6,000 surviving warriors, they were captured and Rome crucified every single one of them. Put them on a road called the Apian Way between Capau and Rome. It was a distance of about 200 kilometres. So you think about it. Every 30 metres as you approached Rome from the south, there's a cross, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one. This was a signal to everybody that approached Rome. This is what happens if you challenge our authority. We will end you. They knew that once the leader was dead, the rest would scatter. It was very cynical, 
but it was a very pragmatic and practical way of stopping any rebellion. And they bet the farm on this one truth. You don't need to disprove the claims of somebody. You don't need to have a rational argument. You don't need to see whether their claims are actually true. You just kill them and move on. It's a lesson that dictator after dictator after dictator has learned throughout the millennia. But can anybody see the problem with this approach? This all rests on that ultimate authority of death being final. If death is not final, then it is not the ultimate sanction. It is not the one that you can threaten people with anymore. If death is not final, if somebody doesn't stay dead, then you have to answer all of those questions. Then you actually have to engage with them. Then you can't threaten them anymore. And this is the problem because Jesus didn't stay dead. And if either the religious bodies or the Romans, now they're in a catch-22. Catch you know, how can they even engage with Jesus anymore? The more they engage with Jesus, the more attention is going to be brought to the fact that he's alive. You know, they had put him on a cross as a symbol. Don't cross us. Don't, you know... This is what happens to people in sedition. This is what happens to people who challenge us. We will put you on a cross. We will kill you. It was a public spectacle. Everybody saw Jesus die. And three days later, he's walking around. How does Rome, how do the Sadducees, how do the Pharisees challenge this? You know, if they walk up to Jesus, hey, I want to discuss, you weren't allowed to do that. No, they're missing the big E on the eye chart. Jesus is alive again, and there's nothing they can do to fight it. If you read through the last four, if you read through the last chapter of each of the four Gospels, if you read like, uh, in John, it's the last two chapters, you know, this is the time between the resurrection and the ascension. No Roman, no priest, no ruling body of the Sanhedrin, nobody challenges Jesus. Why? Because to do so would be to admit, to admit defeat and to be drawing even more attention. They realized at this point they had no answer. They had no authority. <coughs> and just to rub salt in the wounds, Jesus had actually said, you destroy this temple, I'll rise again in three days. As soon as they engage with Jesus, that's going to be the question on everybody's mind. He had not only crushed death, he was you know, sort of rubbing his boot in it, saying, you can't actually, I've conquered death and now I am the ultimate authority. Again, um, where was it? This is another great claim from Lee Strobel's about the resurrection of Jesus. The Romans had bet the farm on killing Jesus. They had bet the farm on it, but they had actually set their Pax Romana was built. The peace of Rome was built on the fact that they would crucify anybody that stood against them, and that person would be dead. Now you have these whispers in this back, backwater little town you know, of Israel. You know, it was a thousand kilometers from Rome, but you start having these whispers. This person didn't stay dead. Rome had a vested interest in making sure that that rumor didn't get out. You know, their entire social structure was built on the fact that our military, our politics, our strength is going to kill anybody that stands against us. But someone didn't stay dead. There's this whisper that there's something else after death. Those Romans would have gone to the ends of the earth to find that body. This is a group of people that had crucified 6,000 prisoners of war. You don't think they would have stooped to torturing the disciples? You don't think if they had have actually believed those two guards, that those, you know, that these... um that the disciples had come and stolen it. Don't you think that if they had to believe those guards, they would have been there doing whatever they could from those disciples to extract a confession? But there was no confession. No matter what, because people, those disciples knew they couldn't betray God. They couldn't say, oh yes, I stole the body. Number one, because they hadn't. But number two, they'd seen what Jesus had done for them and they could never betray him like that. Again, there's another great evidence. Where's the body? There was no body. The entire Roman military would have been searching for that body because the entire Pax Romana was built on the fact that people stay dead. 
and then just one more thing, just to rub, you know, rub salt in the wound even more. Let's just say they did manage to challenge Jesus. Let's just say they did manage, you know, Jesus could disappear at one place and reappear somewhere else. He was fully human. He was actually hungry. He ate. He slept. He got tired. But he could disappear from one spot and reappear somewhere else. He was human, but he was something more as well. But let's just say the Romans somehow managed to capture him. What are they going to do with him? Kill him again? Yeah, that's not going to work out so well for you. He, Jesus here in the resurrection has turned the entire threat of death into, go to your room, please. <laughs> and the disciples knew this. The disciples believed this. You know, you would see all but one of the disciples were martyred. But how did they view that threat? That's it. If you keep preaching about Jesus, we're going to send you to meet him. There was no threat there anymore. They knew the resurrection was real. This wasn't just some theological argument for them anymore. It wasn't just, oh, there will be a resurrection one day. They had seen Christ resurrected and they remembered his promise that they would get to be with him. And so there was no threat anymore. You know, the ultimate threat that Rome had was nothing. Okay, I'll go be with Jesus. You know, you look at Paul's writings. You know, if it were just for me, I'd be out of my mind. But because of you, I stay in my mind. You know, I can't decide whether I want to die and go be with Jesus or stay here and be with you. you know, it was flip-flopping between these two arguments. Is it, you know, death or staying in prison or you know, going and being with Jesus? I'm like, this was the better argument, but he only stayed because he knew he had a job to do. And if we're not afraid of death, then should we be afraid of anything else? No. Erwin McManus, he captures this so perfectly. He says, Jesus' death wasn't there simply to free us from dying. It was to free us from the fear of dying. Jesus came to liberate us so that we would die up front and then live. Because Jesus Christ wants to take us to a place that only dead men and women can go. He continues on and he says, perhaps a part of the energetic power of the church has been lost because we keep inviting people into the safety of Jesus, that he will bless them and give them more and more and more and make them safe. But if you look back at those disciples, that's not what fueled them. Of all the things that fueled those disciples, it wasn't safety. No way in the world were any of the disciples safe from that moment on. They would be told, if you preach here again, you know, we're going to throw you in jail. If you preach here again, we're going to kill you. And you, you can guarantee where they were the next morning. They were back in the temple courts preaching again. They were fueled by the reality of the resurrection because they knew, like that Corinthians verse, that their one true opponent, death, had just, he had used his one and only threat and it had come up short. <coughs> now there will be pain, there will be suffering, there will be hardship and trials. In fact, all of those things are actually promised to the Christ follower. But it wasn't just a pie-in-the-sky theology. It's not as if they were just saying, oh, I just have to tough this out. I just have to, you know, keep my faith in Jesus and then one day I'll get to be with him. No, like Mark mentioned last week, when Christ ascended, not two weeks later, the Holy Spirit came and indwelt with the followers. And they started to live out like there was no fear of death. Not only were they not afraid of the Romans anymore, but they'd start doing other things. They would, they would start treating slaves as equals. They would start referring to each other as brother and sister. If that wasn't the case in the Roman society, you could actually be thrown in prison for calling someone your brother. You know, there was actually legal terms around it. You know, in the Roman world, there wasn't really a true caste system, but there was Roman citizens at the top and slaves at the bottom and sort of bondsmen and civilians and there was a couple of different levels there but in Christ when they came to meet together in the churches and in the temples everybody 
It was one. It was one family. They gave up not only the fear of death, but they gave up the positions that they were holding on to. You know, they would give and share of their resources. All the things that we normally as human beings hold on to as our bit of authority. You know, if I have enough money, I'll be safe. If I have enough honour, I'll be safe. If I have a good enough reputation, I'll be safe. The disciples and all the Christians started just giving up all of these things because they realised if death wasn't if they didn't have to be afraid of death and they didn't have to be afraid of any of these other things as well. You know, they would care for the weak and give of themselves. And occasionally, especially as you read through the latter letters in the New Testament, they would start to forget this and they would start to set themselves up as little kings of their church or they'd start to assign seating so the rich people could sit at the front. And half of Paul's letters are Paul writing to these churches saying, knock it off. This is not what it's about. You've forgotten what the resurrection means. So I just want to finish with two stories as to how we saw this being worked out in the early church and very directly applicable to us now. The first one is what Luke captures in Luke chapter 24. He captures an encounter on the road to Emmaus. This is from verse 13. The same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking about it. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked, they discussed these things with each other. And Jesus came up and walked with them. But they were kept from recognizing them. And he asked, what are you doing as you discuss, as discussing together as you walk along? Yeah, I'm just trying to picture this. You know, two people downcast. Oh, did you remember when Jesus did that? Yeah, and gosh, do you remember when he stood up to those far- Man, do you remember the time we had that great feed of fish? Yeah. And somebody comes up behind them. Hi, hey guys, what are you talking about? They stood still. Their faces were downcast. And then one of them, named Clopas, he sort of turns quizzically and asks, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here? What, what, what are you, some backwater guy that just doesn't read the newspaper? Have you not heard what's happened? Don't you understand why we're so downcast? And Jesus, oh, really? What things? Seriously, what things? That's in the Bible. What things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. You know, the chief priests and our leaders, they handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. We we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it is the third day since all of these things took place. And now, you know, there's some even more disturbing news. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning and they didn't find the body. So now we don't even know where the body is. They came and told us they'd seen the vision of angels who said he was alive. But you know these women, we can't trust women. They're not reliable witnesses. But then some of our companions, they went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But they didn't see Jesus. You know, I love it. There's either that, you know, well, we trusted our companions that we sent. We didn't trust the women, but we trusted our companions that we sent. And Jesus continues to walk with them. And as you read through the rest of Luke, he's actually correcting them. It's like, well, why are you surprised? Didn't Jesus say this? Didn't Jesus say that? He corrects them and encourages them, and they invite him to stay. And then their eyes are opened. And Jesus departs, leaving them to tell the other disciples. Luke 24, 31 says, Our eyes were opened and we saw him. You know, that resurrection, Jesus had been freed from all of the bonds of our fallen humanity and he was whatever God had actually made humanity to be in the first place. But that means that for all of us, Jesus can be right here with us. And we're not aware of it. John Orberg has an amazing book called God is Closer Than You Think, and it actually explores this. I've got a couple of copies at home if you want to read it. But it's a reminder to us, just like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, they thought they knew everything about Jesus. They thought that they were that inner sanctum. You know, they knew that they, that they knew what Jesus was going to do. And Jesus came right up behind them and had a conversation for, let's call it four miles or five miles along that road to Emmaus, and they didn't recognize him. But even in that, it changed who they were. They went and told all the other disciples, this is what we have seen. 
For us, it might be that person who cuts us off in traffic. It might be that person that we just strike up a conversation with on the train. It might be that new person at work. You know, but God is right there. God is right there wanting to teach us something and we just need to open our eyes as Luke twenty four thirty one says, okay, God, is this you talking to me right now? And the Holy Spirit can guide us. And when we wake up every morning, okay, God, I want your Holy Spirit to indwell me and I want to see, I want you to open my eyes and see where you want to teach me, where you want to guide me. Because God is right here and sometimes we're just not aware of it. And then we reach the final point. And I started, we started this service on authority. I started this sermon on authority. Jesus at Easter, he displayed his authority. And now we get to the final verse in Matthew 20. Oh, Matthew 28. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And we've just seen he has been displaying all of that authority. So therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you to the end of the age. Two things I want to say about this, because we say it so often, we can just sort of rattle it off our tongue and not actually think about the implications of this. Firstly, when Jesus says, all authority... And 40 days earlier, he had risen from the dead, proving how much authority he had. Where does he think the disciples are going to go to to appeal this decision? You know, in our court system, we are used to, if I go to the local court and I don't like what they say to me, I can go to the state court, I can appeal that. If they don't like it, I can go to the Supreme Court. I can always go to a higher authority. If I don't like what you're saying, I will just go to a higher authority until I can disobey you. Do we do that in the Western world? We do, all the time. Jesus starts this instruction. All authority in heaven and on earth. As if saying all authority wasn't enough. All authority in heaven if you want to appeal there. All authority on earth if you want to make an appeal there. Nope. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is where the buck stops. Therefore, you can't argue with this. You have nothing to argue back with. This is my instruction to you. Go and make disciples. Not only that, go and make disciples. So do you think when he said go and make disciples, you know, Peter and James and John looked at each other and said, well, okay, well, Peter, you're the leader, so you disciple John and James, and, you know, after six months, then John will disciple you and John, and then six months after that, James can disciple John was it meant to be a closed little environment? No, it was meant to be go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For thousands of years, Judaism had been insular. It had been looking in on itself. You know, we are going to worship God for ourselves. We are going to worship our God, our, or his way. Most of the time it was our way. We're going to worship our God for us. God is going to protect us. God is going to fight for us. The final words that Jesus said is, go out into that world and make disciples of Jerusalem. That's not what he said, was it? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and I love that. Baptize them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When did the Holy Spirit come? Ten days later. It was like this little teaser, wasn't it? There's something else that's coming. You knew my Father. You knew me. And I'm telling you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's something else amazing coming. You're just going to have to trust me. And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And I love that, the teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. As an IT person, we've got this idea of, it's called recursiveness. You know, if I have something and it does this job, and then part of that job is to start again, 
in IT, we call that recursion, recursion, and it just keeps going and going and going, and you can never get out of it. Jesus' final teaching. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and this is my final command. You are to make disciples, teach them everything about me, including this command that they go and teach everything about. And then those people will take this command, and then those people will take this command. And that was Jesus' sole strategy for you know, changing the world and introducing everybody to his Father. Is I'm going to start by instructing these 12 guys, and they're going to teach. And then they're going to teach, and they're going to teach, and they're just going to reach their friends, and they're going to make disciples, and they're going to make disciples. And that was his one and only plan. And now, 2,000 years later, it's been entrusted to us. And there's no authority that we can challenge to and say, oh, that's not my job. I mean, yes, it is. You know, we can try and say, oh, my Christian faith is about serving the poor. Good, so it should be. Oh, my Christian faith is about holding somebody's hand and supporting them at difficult times. Great. Yep, it should be. Oh, my Christian faith is limited just to teaching my friends. Good, yes, you should teach your friends. But the final command with all authority was go into this world and make disciples. And we don't get to argue with that. And that's what we have coming out of this Easter when we know who the true authority lays with. I'll just pray for us and then we'll just finish with that one song. And God has been very generous today and I think my voice is just about to peter out. So <laughs> it's done its job. God, we just thank you. God, we thank you that you displayed all authority over sickness and death and sore throats. Lord, we thank you that in the resurrection we see that you are the one that we have our hope in, and rightly so. We thank you that you are the one that has all authority over everything that would challenge your word going forward. Lord, we commit ourselves in that authority, you know, to taking your word, to reaching our friends, to making disciples and seeing their lives transformed as you have transformed ours. Lord, never let us forget that if we are not afraid of death because you have conquered that then we need not be afraid of anything else lord give us that courage and give us that encouragement you know to take whatever you have given us whatever you have placed in our hands to do your will and to see more people entering your kingdom lord i just pray that you would bless every single one of us with an opportunity this week or this month you know to share of you to sh in the shadow of Easter, to share what Easter truly is and the impact that you have had on our lives. And Lord, we look forward to rejoicing as you do call more people home, as more people see your resurrection and what it means for their life and come join you in that. God, we thank you for everything you give us. Amen.